For those of you who are new to us, we hold our seminars and lectures every Wednesday evening in Rome. And tonight is our attempt to move this important aspect of our work online. We will be holding a weekly event until mid-July, so do sign up using our mailing list or Twitter where you can register for future talks. Before I disappear from your screens, I wanted to hand you over to Marta Pellerini, who is our fine arts curator, and she will be in conversation with John Walter, uh, a familiar name to some of you, but Marta will introduce you to him in more detail. And then I'll re reappear at the end of the conversation and be able to put some of your questions to our speakers. So we just ask that you use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to put your questions in. I should also say that the, the conversation is being recorded. So thank you very much for joining us and I look forward to hearing the conversation between Marta and John. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Harriet. Um, so uh, I'm Marta Pellerini, um, the BSR Fine Arts Advisor, and I am extremely happy to be in conversation today with John Walter. Um, John uh, is a visual artist, a curator and an academic based in London. Um, he was a Sainsbury Scholar uh, at the BSR from 2006 to 2008 um, and I was extremely happy to have him back last year as one of the speakers uh, of our uh, talk gender series, uh, um, a, su a series of talks uh, focused on the theme of gender. Um, John's in interest uh, on virology was first fully expressed in the 2015 project Alien Sex Club, which explored the relationship between visual culture and HIV today. Uh, the installation was scientifically accurate uh, because it was curate, uh, created sorry, in close collaboration uh, with uh, HIV researchers uh, at the London University College. Um, a few years later, in 2018, uh, John developed again his interest uh, on the topic of uh, uh, viruses, and in particular on HIV, in the installation Capsid, um, where he analyzed the virus as a structure. Uh, for this project, John worked again in close collaboration with virologists in order to better understand how a capsid works uh, as a vehicle for the virus spread. Uh, so my first question to John is, uh, um, how and when have you started to be interested in virology and in science? Uh, in general gosh can you hear me all right yeah um i don't know about virology but um i was an all-rounder at school and so i never really saw any distinction between things but sexual health has always been an interest and so whether it's to do with pubic lice or scabies or gonorrhea hiv is the big one because it's the big killer um, maybe syphilis was in the Victorian period and then it crept up on me I suppose um, well I suppose after Rome um, I'd come back to London in about 2008 and, and things started shifting around the work then and um, it was through trying to work out what this Alien Sex Club project was that I started to get really deeply involved in the virus stuff yeah uh, but now um, and so i wanted to ask you uh, one thing regarding this so the subject of the hiv um, in visual arts um, has been dominated by the figure of felix gonzalez torres mm. um, and then many artists have followed the same post-minimalism way of talking about queer subjects. Uh, but your approach is completely the opposite. Mm. Um, you call it maximalism. 
Um, so can you explain a little bit uh, what uh, maximalism is? So really you can see my work in the long haul as a research into this question of what is maximalism. And one way of interrogating that is through the virus. So first of all, yes, my argument has been and still holds water that um, queer subjects have been dominated by post-minimal discourse and that doesn't do them much help now because we're over familiar with that, uh, that binary. Um, what is maximalism? Well, maximalism isn't just the opposite of minimalism. In fact, it's, it's much more than that. Um, two people have really commented on this. Dougie Field, the artist, says it's minimalism with a plus, plus, plus on one hand. And then um, Robert Pincus Whitson on the other says it's kind of uh, trans avant-garde, return to figurative art in the 80s, which is neither, neither is a fit for purpose definition. What, what I think maximalism is, is to do with complexity and complexity theory and actually accepting that things don't need to be reduced. They, they can be dealt with simultaneously and that the nature of things, the nature of culture, which is a branch of nature, is for things to proliferate. And in that complexity, one way of dealing with that is to try and reduce down. That's been the traditional Western methodology. Another way to deal with this is to build a different cognitive architecture. And that's my current argument. And maximalism is to do with the building that brain architecture and a, an external visual architecture that enables that to happen. So that's to do with working serially. It's to do with uh, breeding variants. So really, I'm a kind of farmer of images who uh, administers new breeds in crop rotation and the complexity builds and the maximalism is really the aesthetic for managing that overload. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And what's useful, the virus is a useful clue for that because, and, and we can talk about specific viruses, but let's just say the virus for the time being, in that it does things bottom up. Now what's interesting about nature is it finds solu design solutions by feeling around. It's not a top-down designer. And so what I'm learning from uh, economics, from weather, from virology and all these things is that um, there is a, there's a lot to learn from nature as a designer that I can then import as a top-down designer and that's also something to do with maximalism yeah yeah uh, but in your recent uh, research um two years on um you completely you you changed not completely you com you changed um your interest um because now your current work is about means Mm. Um, uh, so what, what is a meme yeah. and uh, um, how did you switch from mm. the interest in virus of the body uh, mm. to the interest uh, um, in viruses of the mind? Yes, so it's grown naturally out of capsid. The, I think where I was trying to get to in Capsid was this point, inevitably, it's great to look back and um, post-rationalise, but the, the analogies I was having to make to explain the Capsid to people were cultural ones. So by showing a virus walks into a bar, for example, by making analogies to Coronation Street, to Twin Peaks, to Teletubbies, I started to realise that I, I didn't know about meme theory or this whole wealth of information and, and, and research going on, or this, this idea of virus of the mind, which is one way of defining a meme. Um, so I was starting to think, how do cultural forms replicate? 
is there an analogy between viruses and cultural forms? Lo and behold, that analogy has been being made well before me, and it helps me rethink it. So what is a mean? Uh, Richard Dawkins coins the term in The Selfish Gene. He says that uh, cultural forms replicate in an, an analogous way to viruses or biological forms. And he, he coins this word meme, meme, and uh, a meme is a unit of cultural replication. Now, that's a disputed term. That's up for grabs by the user. What I think is important is that somehow, what, what I think is important is that um, it forces a scale shift in how we think about how things are replicated and who's got control of them. If you think of yourself as an author and a designer and having full agency, the meme is not going to be useful for you. If you think of the meme as a thing that uses you to advance itself, and the meme could be Zoom, the meme could be the English language or certain portions of it, the meme could be the Paisley pattern. There's a, a scale at which you can look at how things replicate, and we are just a vehicle of its transmission as humans or human brains. And what I find useful about the meme thinking is that it begins to be about how do you get information between brains? What are the midpoints of that transaction? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you developed this idea of memes uh, in your most recent projects. Yeah. And I was uh, um, really fascinated by the projects of the Jacobiti uh, yeah. Paisley, um, uh, but also the video game uh, yeah. you, um, you are developing, which is amazing also the fact that you can, you know, work on different media, uh, paint, really paintings, installations, video games, uh, also music, because you also recorded... Uh, the very Sorry. No problem. You also recorded uh, an album, a music album. <laughs> um, performance is really... Um, you're amazing and uh, um, yes this is one of the um, this is the video game and yeah, also this is South Cottian which tells the story of Joanna Southcott who was a prophet in the Georgian period who believed she was going to give birth to the new messiah and she also left a box of prophecies to the nation to be opened in a time of crisis I initially thought this could be Brexit but maybe coronavirus is more important um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at memes on multiple fronts simultaneously. Yeah. Um, I mean, religious ideas are particularly infectious memes. And that's why the virus analogy is useful. You know, a meme wants to get your attention. It wants to be, you know, an internet meme is, is the common example, but actually there's better examples. So um, religious movements will employ uh, meme plexes, uh, sticky brain glues like singing, architecture, uh, literature, other art forms to stick their religious memes to, to make them uh, more contagious. Um, what you're seeing here is me going playing through multiple levels of this VR game, but it's actually a complete 360 world. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll jump around. This is another level where she meets the devil and she used to offer you a seal that she would, um, she would seal you into heaven and you could pay for a prophecy with a wax seal. Um, and what's also interesting about her is that she's part of a lineage of prophets. So not only does she die and the whole thing burns essentially intellectually, but it's a relay race of memes in which she eventually, her memes get carried on by James Jersham Jezreel, who's another, maybe I'll show, should I show some of his stuff? 
Yeah, 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 please. Uh. So th this was a building that was built in Medway in Kent um, in 1897. Um, and it was, so Jezreel had come back, his name was James Roland White, and he had been in the military. And he came back from India to Chatham Dockyard, and he was reading Southcott's prophecies en route. And he began to get the bug for these ideas. Bear in mind, this is a time of, you know, war and upheaval and that her period is famines as well. But there's lots of underlying things fueling this cult behavior. And um, he receives a message in a dream that he needs to build a temple to house the lost tribes of Israel ready for the last the day of judgment. Okay. And uh, at this time, there's a culture of believing that the lost tribes of Israel are British or English, which is called British Israelism. Okay. I mean, it's completely bonkers. Um, <laughs> he dies in the, before the foundations are laid, but he's very, very successful at gathering cult members. There's about 1,500 members. And one of the ways, th this is a vision of what it would have looked like um, had it been completed. Um, and I'm, I'm building this as a computer game. Uh, well, it's going to be a film actually in, in okay. 15 chapters. So this, this is quite a good rendering of what it would have looked like. The yeah. tunnel going in the bottom had a railway that fed the printing presses, which were underneath. Okay. And he published a paper called The Flying Roll, the, yeah. the emblem of which was a trumpet with a scroll coming off it. And this paper was sold internationally particularly in the new world, in America, and in, in colonies, essentially. And he recruited people from Michigan, rich farmers, to come over to Kent and build with him. There was a bakery, a butcher's, uh, a farm, and he was very businesslike. And that all fed into the, the spread of, of, the, of the ideas. Um, so this will, this will eventually be... Oh, here's a, this is a good uh, image of... The, the flying roll and also this cross keys. I've started to add in my interest in Paisley. That doesn't go far. Um, this is the tower and he also appropriated this kind of um, Prince of Wales feathers. So again, with memes, it's always about gluing them together into larger meme plexes. And I've, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but to, you know, the, the performance that you're referring to that I did in New Zealand, is a kind of manifesto for all of this stuff okay. where it tells the story of uh, the universe from the big bang right through to memes. Yeah. And um, Daniel Dennett's idea really is that um, the, there is a primordial soup that is maybe, this is Joanna Southcott, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that's made somehow over a long period of evolutionary time, beginning to generate replicating parts, molecules. And they could be clays actually that um, crystallize. And that's, that's, that's an interesting discussion. But um, they get going and then they start to form do loops. There's this idea of, of do loops and things repeating in ways that catch on. And that builds into, over a very long period of evolutionary time, a genetic sequence and then a memetic sequence. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me to shut up or change the subject. No, I just want you to, I, w I want to connect uh, uh, these images uh, to the Jacoviti Paisley and also, you know, the discourse because, uh, um, of course, in terms of the infection of ideas, uh, um, pattern also and you know um, and so on you, re you, you realize also this amazing mix of uh, um, images different you know completely different uh, because yeah uh, yes. one is figurative the other one also is more abstract if we, if we can yeah and this is a good um, point because 
the Acaviti, for, for those British people that don't know him, is a famous yeah. Italian illustrator. There is no real equivalent in, in England or in the UK. Maybe Wicked Willy or the Red Bull ads are the closest. Oh, um, oh. Um, so what you're seeing here is, is a very big book of paintings that I've made. It's two and a half meters wide and there's 49 paintings. And the, the book took, took over a year to make, actually more like a year and a half, two years. Um, why am I doing that? Why am I making these juxtapositions? I'm trying to make the Paisley fitter, uh, uh, evolutionarily fitter. So what I'm doing is I'm importing analogies from evolutionary biology into the art making process. And um, Paisley is a great example of a replicator. It, it, uh, and, and what Dawkins defines as a good replicator, it has fecundity, fidelity, and longevity, i.e. It's, it's really infectious. And Paisley has been a great example of that over historical and geogra geographical time and space. I'm trying to bring it forward by, in this case, making it more sexual because one reading of the Paisley motif is that it's a fertility symbol. So in Patterns in Time, which is what I call this larger project, I'm sort of setting up my stall with new botes or booters or mango seed which is one possible definition or origin of the and if you you know if you see a, a germinating mango seed you suddenly think uh hello yeah. Yeah. um and then really by breeding it with other images uh, or with historical versions of itself a bit like we might uh, breed an heirloom carrot my analogy has been that I'm making heirloom paisleys or bringing back earlier varieties or, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a bit like um, trying to breed a mammoth from an elephant or something like this. So there's always um, a farming or a, a, an animal analogy in all of these things. Um, and there's other experiments that are going on. So there's big sketchbooks of Paisleys and other things. And by bringing them into close proximity with one another, they start to hybridize. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and talking about the mango. Yeah. Um, so you um, are spending a part of your uh, quarantine doing uh, tarot reading okay. dressed up as Alfonso Mango yeah. <laughs> that I love. I was one of the participants of the tarot <laughs> reading. I think one of the first also. Um, there you are. Yeah, this is me taking a picture of us. I was <laughs> very proud of that tarot uh, matriarchy. Uh, <laughs> And um, so um, I, I wanted to, to ask you, um, um, you know, uh, apart from reading Tarot, uh, uh, this process uh, is, is, is all about uh, um, hospitality and also um, it's a kind of uh, thera therapeutic for you, for me also. Uh, yeah. Because at some point, uh, when you were reading the tarot, uh, I I started to you know to talk about my life, mm -hmm. what I was doing, uh, how I w how I was feeling in that moment. Uh, um, so um, yes, I wanted to ask you um, why you are doing it uh, and um, why hospitality is uh, you know important in this uh, um in, in this, in yeah. this thing of tarot I, I think that the the bars and the tarot are are interrelated and i brought them into play a long time ago as devices for gluing people 
into my work and gluing my work into a context. Now I realize through all the meme thinking that that's classic memetic engineering, that by associating something or embedding it within a bigger meme plex, it gives it uh, more ability to travel. The tarot is, is a meme plex of its own. Uh, and also the tarot is, is a virus in that it's, um, it's a genetic sequence. It's a narrative sequence. And I'm increasingly understanding it as a, a system like the virus that can feel around for opportunity. So in the way that the coronavirus has been noodling at a genetic level in relation to ourselves until it's got uh, agency and it is not trying to do something, it's just feeling in, in genetic space. In, in cultural space, we do the same. And the tarot is a great example of that. So you've got 78 images. From that, you can make virtually any narrative. And it isn't a divinatory system, but because of the premise of it, it becomes so. So yes, your story is classic in that what tends to happen in my tarot reading is that people will confide in me, but really I'm just a mirror for them. Yes. And my stupid attire, which is not that different to my daily attire, but I wear a wig, <laughs> is that um, it lures people into a false security. But it's not false really, because that we all know what the game is. I'm just the facilitator of that. And then the tarot are images that we can reflect on. And what's happened is that um, I've started to design a new set in response to, lock, uh, to lockdown. And these are actually going to be for uh, Plymouth Art Weekend uh, later in the year, either in real space or virtual space. And this brings my lexicon since the Alien Sex Club Tarot, so 2015. That was the first time you you designed uh, no there was a set prior to that actually there's oh, a set okay. in 2011 and really they're about it's about lexicons and it's about having a wide enough image pool to be able to make these narratives from so oh there we go <laughs> kissing her um you know and, and I, there's a certain constituent number of parts that you need. Oh, hello, we're in Italy. I didn't think well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which come, you know, return very, very often, uh, also in your catalogue, uh, Caps. Yes. Why yeah. are you so, you know, interested in this symbol? There are a lot of Italian things, of course, I can imagine that, uh, the, the, you know, the residency... Uh, cool. Yeah, uh, I don't know whether I'm interested in it or in it's interested in me. You know, <laughs> if, if you take the memes eye perspective on it, um, it's it's somehow gaining my attention. This is another Italian illustrator. Um, uh, I can't remember his name, but yeah, I think that I'm a carrier of images, and you just what one sifts through culture for the images it uh, that appeal that 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 um that g gain my attention and then i further them by in this case i'm redrawing them in tilt brush so that these are all virtual reality drawings mm -hmm. and so they have a very strange quality of yeah. being uh woven uh th th mm -hmm. this isn't the highest res when you're in there they look embroidered and this has got a strange connection to the paisley project because uh they're like embroidered shawls and so strange coalescences between projects have been happening during lockdown that i'm quite excited about hello <laughs> um, Amazing. yeah Amazing. and it's a strange process of tracing and distortion and it extends all my interest in in distortion um, but it's taken it to another level because there's a new colour capacity that I have available in Tilt Brush than I would have, say, using a Wacom tablet. And so it's pushed the whole drawing project forward a lot. 
um, and also when you photograph them, you you're on an angle, and so d another level of distortion happens. Oh, yes. Um, shoe people, eggs, Adventure Time. This was in New Zealand. Um, German things, a mask that I bought, and so there will be uh, I, about halfway through these drawings. Um, and they can exist as a virtual space too, which is exciting. Amazing, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and talking about, uh, um, always talking about vir virtual spaces, uh, um, uh, or maybe talking about spaces, uh, mm. um, there is a, yes, uh, I want to, to to make a step behind and do a consider make a consideration on the um, on the spaces uh, um, architectural spaces that are okay. so important in your work, especially um, uh, bars and hospices, uh, which mm -hmm. is another space that you developed uh, in, mm -hmm. uh, in virtual uh, uh, that became a virtual space. Um, so um, you um, so these places, these spaces uh, were intended three months ago as a spaces of uh, hospitality where people could feel also welcome. Mm. And now uh, with this emergency, they are considered uh, as a very dangerous spaces mm. where you can get the virus. Um, so how? Mm. Do you, you know, it's a completely different, uh, you know, uh, approach to them. Mm. There is now a completely different approach to them. How do you think that, uh, you know, your practice uh, can develop it? If, if yeah. it... I, I don't know. I mean, London lockdown has not been the same here as it has been for you. It's been nowhere near as draconian. But also, I think the, I live in South Southeast London, and it doesn't look like lockdowns going on today. I okay. mean, something there's some energy, and whether it's the sun or people have just got bored with lockdown. But it looks like it's naturally lifting, and okay. people, there's a tranche of people that go, "Oh, I, d I don't think we'll ever go back to normal," and then I just think it won't ever. It, it would be exactly the same you know people can forget quite quickly yeah this is true um the bars you know again memes and genes interact and uh memes gain an advantage when they tap into certain uh things that give us genetic advantage sexual things food things to do with safety or fear so the bar is another great space because it's about drinking and pleasure and flirting and laughter and food and drink. So if you glue all your imagery into that environment, it's got an advantage for how it will infect people. Um, the interest in architecture is about this maximalism thing. What is the join? How do I make a spatial conjunctive between things? And over the long haul of my work, that's been about gluing languages together or visual elements through different forms of collage. But actually there is no definitive answer to that problem. It can be expanded and contracted multiple times. And actually what's going on at the moment is my practice is going through a contraction because of lockdown, but in a very creative way. So it's giving me license to just be in the studio and push patterns in time, which is the Paisley project ahead, making lino cuts and other things that have been lying around for ages to do and speed up the experiments. Now the internet can be a, a join, virtual reality can be a join, video can be a join, architecture can be a join. And what's important is to go between them and use them as test sites to put selective pressure on the imagery. So what do I mean by that? Um, let me show you 
Shall I show you some of Mobius Hospice as a yeah. way of talking mm -hmm. about this? Yeah. So this is a very um, long-term project that I'm working on. These are stills from a VR space. So Mobius Hospice is a proposal for a new type of palliative care center. Uh, and I'm working with a location uh, in Plymouth, uh, an estate called Barnbarton. And uh, really it's about bringing well-being to a place by talking more openly about death. And it, it grows out of my father's death about two years ago and his stoicism and the liberation that I found and I think he found in removing euphemism and talking openly about it. So we didn't say we'd lost him or, he, you know, um, he'd passed away, he died. And there was a, and that's very relevant to the, the current moment, isn't it? Suddenly everybody wants to talk about death or yeah. has to. Yeah. Um, so Mobius Hospice is more than just a hospice. It's a school. There's an apartment building. There's therapy center. There's a crematorium. Uh, it's about investing in a place in a completely different way, but it's about being open about death. And um, the, the architecture is really a vehicle for me to bring my parts, put them into a new space and test them and then export them. So really in all my work, it's about making analogies and taking things across borders and then back again. And there is an analogy between um, you that, you know, you are trying to um, unfold um, an os the hospice, an hospice, uh, yeah. um, and create a new kind of, um, um, of place. And uh, the Jezreel Tower, which was uh, a build uh, that basically was not anymore only a building uh, it was uh, an entire village uh, with uh, you know shops and uh, you know all the things uh, yes you're right i don't know if there is a connection it's a kind of utopia yeah and that's an interest it's an interesting moment i think in the cycle the historical cycle for us to revisit utopian thinking and i think it, there will be an impact on architecture um, um, I've been, you know, my PhD was through an architecture faculty and I've taught in architecture school as a way really of displacing myself as another, as being another foreigner again. But the ambition is to build a building. This is a long term strategy. Yes. Um, and, and the person that is my inspiration for this is uh, Friedensreich Hundertwasser, who didn't build anything in the UK or Italy, I think, but mostly in Austria and Germany. Okay. And Hundertwasser's th thinking was all about, uh, he, he had this idea of a peace treaty with nature. And he really wanted, it's more than a hippie vision. He's trying to, I think, in, an, in another way, talk about bottom up and top down design, finding a happy home together, i.e. humans and the rest of nature or memes and genes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm beginning to talk about in Mobius Hospice. And I'm having to invent a new way of working and a new vocabulary for myself for it, which is very hard. And things like Jezreel's Tower are the model to enable me to solve that problem. Um, and yeah, I think that the, the, three, the maximalism is all about what Tim Harford calls slow motion multitasking or gradualism that in having this many projects with each with its own moving parts, so many on the go simultaneously, it enables me to ignore one for a moment and turn my back to another, but in so doing, learn from that one and bring it into play in this one in a, in a subconscious way almost. And it's very, very slow and laborious and difficult but it's very efficient as well so yes you you've hit the nail on the head that Jezreel's Tower is somehow a training camp for Mobius Hospice and you wouldn't think that um, but unlikely information can come across 
in a way that for somebody else that you, operates a more reduced practice, that would never be possible. Yeah. Also because in terms of, uh, um, you know, the, the, the hospice, as you said, is a place where um, that has a, a strong connection with death and dying. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Jay's Real Tower um, yes. was very connected to the religion, uh, which is another uh, yeah. way of talking about death. And Absolutely. And the hospice is such a hot topic in all countries at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. How is it funded? It's not funded by the state primarily. It's going to have to be. You know, if we've learned anything in the UK from this, the NHS needs to be better funded and things like hospices need to be brought into state control and they need to be integrated. Social care needs to be integrated into the daily life in a different way. The separation out of the parts isn't helping the problem yeah. it's making more of a problem so i think that suddenly the meaning of this project has changed in the past month um and yes the there is a question here around religion because i'm an atheist and i have an agenda to promote atheism in the project so in trying to understand as a mimetic engineer you know i think that as artists we're all cultural engineers well artists archaeologists art historians we're all and re-engineering cultural products um learning from the infectious the infection rate of religious ideas could help me improve the infection rate of atheist thinking okay <laughs> <laughs> the megalomaniac kicks in wow. <laughs> that's a different project yeah yeah it's another one <laughs> amazing yeah really I am, I am really impressed uh, um, also, as I was saying to you yesterday or two days ago, I am really impressed about the, um, uh, the, the number of words that we are using now and that became, yeah. such as also death, um, that became very, you know, um, common to use and that three months ago were very specific uh, to mm -hmm. these uh, uh, subjects, to specific subject, subject matters. Uh, yes. Um, uh, we, we, learned, we learned how to use uh, uh, the word uh, antiretroviral therapy. We use, you know, there are so yeah. many words that we are using now in our language uh, that, you know, are so common in your work in your practice yeah i mean i love jargon and i like moving it uh, out of context i mean th these are these are images of a, an ongoing sketchbook that i'm working on at the moment cytokine storm is suddenly a very n known phrase and greg towers who i was working with on capsid his lab are going to be looking at how a cytokine storm works and how you might intervene in that I mean, my work is always about trying to popularize jargon, confuse jargon, uh, make poetry from it or show how poetic it is. Um, the, these are collisions of images that I've picked up recently with uh, en engineered parts. You know, this is what I'm talking about. Each environment that I work in, in this case, a sketchbook, it puts a selective pressure on the imagery. But yeah, the, the jargon of the virus is, um, it's good that people know more about this. You know, yeah. it empowers them. Yeah. Um, and art is one way of allowing the information to spread. It's another route yeah, yeah. for memes to travel, if you like. It's another way of spreading culture. Yes, yeah. It's a sticky way. You know, and if, if uh, a virus, it doesn't have agency, it just wants to replicate. It's a very small string of, it's a very small algorithm. Yeah. And that really interests me that uh, it's smallness and it can do this much stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I think that um, artwork just want to get your attention. Memes just want to get your attention and they'll find through nature the best way to get replicated yeah. and we as artists and makers and uh, academics and so on 
need to harness what we know about this from evolutionary biology to our advantage um, because there's so much to learn there. And I think that's what Hundertwasser was talking about. You know, he was obsessed with the spiral and with these natural forms and then he could glue his culture onto them. And in that kind of splicing or chimera of the two types of thing, they sort of helped each other out. Nice. Um, uh, now, you know, it's maybe um, not the right time to ask you, but have you got a um, future project that you are developing uh, um, uh, for the future months? Yeah, so I'm juggling at the moment between uh, Jezreel's Tower. So I'll show you some of the set, uh, the sets I'm making. Um, so this this project has been slightly delayed because of um, because of the emergency. Because of the emergency. So um, this is a set in development in the VR for the Corn Exchange in Rochester, which is where a big meeting was held when uh, there was a change of leadership of the cult. And so I'm building these sets. This is the naval vessel that Jezreel traveled over on from, um, from India. And then this is an imaginary uh, Gillingham High Street. So these are very slow to build, but they're incredibly strange spaces to inhabit in 360. And what I will do is I will perform in costume. These are costumes for the characters. So there's a screenplay. Um, this is a new type of blouse I've invented called wow. the cold shoulder of mutton. Wow. So you have a cold shoulder on one side and a leg of mutton sleeve on the other. And these are patterns that I've had printed on different types of cloth. And then um, three people I know help me sew. Okay. Um, there's waistcoats. There's dresses. Wow. This is Jamie Bradley wearing one of my um, <laughs> coats. So yes, once I've built all the sets, I can start to shoot all the live action. Um, th this is a, a storyboard for one of the scenes. Jezreel used music a lot to attract people to the cult, even oh. just as guests. And that became a very, very clever way of uh, promoting his ideas. Um, so that's one thing. And then Patterns in Time is really moving ahead rapidly. So I'm making a new book of paintings at the moment, which is really inspired by CRISPR gene editing technology, which I'm trying to get my head around. So you could think of these as very short strands of DNA. Um, they'll, they'll completely transform. There's 25 sheets of paper that get drawn on, then they get bound into a book. And then I work back into the hybrids that I create. Um, I've been working, I'm working on a big series of uh, paintings um, that are fabric. Yes. So these are, um, these are going to be appliqued and embroidered um, with various motifs that I'm making in felt and uh, with sewing. And there's 10 of these. Um, and then this is a series of lino cuts that I'm currently working yeah, on. Yeah, this one that I saw in the, in the past days, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you what, what's yeah. what's. This? So I'm calling this series The Flame of Zoroaster. And one of the origins of the Paisley pattern is that it, it sort of emerges in Persia. And it, it's, there's an element of its culture that is related to Zoroastrianism. And, um, there's this motif of a bird with outstretched wings. I've, I made a bunch of lino um, blocks over a year ago that I didn't have anywhere to print. And I've, I've worked out how to print them in the studio now. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm printing them in par partially across a sheet of paper and then I'm working into them to sort of join the motifs together. So really what I'm doing is I'm growing visual cultures in a Petri dish. And the hybrids, the joins between the sort of visual glue becomes the subject matter for the next body of work. So really what's hap happening, which is, um, this is a phrase from complex adaptive systems that I'm really fond of, is to do with the proliferation of niches. I'm opening up more and more lines of inquiry 
rather than closing them down, which is mad, but it's incredibly productive and it's a joy. So I'm trying to just um, design the experiments. There's an experiment to make a series of square paintings based on moon shawls, which were these square shawls that had a circle in the middle and in each corner. I'm using the forms from the history of the, the Paisley and the Kashmir shawl. Um, and I'm trying to work inwards from, yeah. from the, the experiments, from the Yakoviti Paisley and the things you've seen. So what happens, I think, in these big projects is I sort of set up stalls and then they become the peripheral elements that allow me to build hybrids in between. This is a really difficult project to resolve. This is 344 shrinky dinks. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know what shrinkies are, it's a kind of plastic that you draw on and you bake in the oven and it shrinks by half. So these were made over a year and they relate to lots of different things. And I made a bunch of them for Alien Sex Club and showed them in a case. I'd like to resolve these differently and potentially I'm going to laser cut into something and insert them all. But uh, to return to the virus question, it's all to do with polymerization. How do I make long chains? How do I conjoin things together? How do I make meme plexes? Individually, these things are nothing. They're, they're mildly distracting. If they can be conjoined in odd ways, they can be very, very interesting. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm working on in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> okay. Should um, we move on to questions? Yes. Uh, is Harriet... Uh, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, thank you so much, John. That was a really rich talk, and to Marta as well. It's so nice to see you speaking you, and drawing John. us ideas. And... Um, I don't know, your humour and the ideas you brought to us and the, the complexity, it's really, no, it's really fantastic. Um, I'm going to invite the audience to send in their questions. Right. Uh, and I, I see something flashing, but I, yeah. So please do use the Q&A function. But while we wait for the um, online audience to, to ask those questions, John, I was wondering, um, you know you were talking about memes as kind of replicating mm. and, and therefore continuing. What did the memes stop or do they just pause in your in your kind of visualization? What would No, I think that they they constantly reshuffle their parts in the mm -hmm. same way that any organism, any um, genetic sequence mm. uh, re reshuffles when it uh, builds a new phenotype. So mm. if you imagine, you know, my genes are my mum and my dad's genes spliced. Mm. The, the, the memes that are in operation in the Yakoviti Paisley take on a new energy because of mm -hmm. my hybridizing of them. All I'm doing is um, reshuffling the parts mm. in order to make, in order to keep them going, to re-energize yeah. them. And um, I mean, is it Stephen Shannon, I think, who's an archaeologist, who's talking about, you know, um, the way flint axes are, uh, cut or things like this there are ways of doing things that are efficient and that are fit we're talking mm -hmm. about evolutionary fitness mm -hmm. um, as artists as humans we're the only people that can engineer these things and it's about trying to things will die yes things go by the wayside that is the selective pressure or certain things will have more dominance than others and those you know, at the moment in the media, viruses are getting a lot of attention and then that will die down and Love Island will get a lot of attention. Mm, mm, exactly, those yeah. two things are actually in competition with each other. Yeah. In, in mimetic terms. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. It's a very complex, but it's a very simple way of, of cutting through it and just saying cultural production mm. is about... Uh, the f making your memes fitter yeah so i'm gonna i don't think any questions have come i think it's a through. bit of a 
funny system, isn't it? Yeah, let me have a look. No, there's no questions yet. But um, this is a blue rose moment. <laughs> we can say no. Yeah, blue I mean, I was... rose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for the online audience, that was our secret word for stopping, our secret password for stopping. But, um, <laughs> I was, but I was also wondering, um, just to give any of the online audiences a, a few more minutes to, to type in their questions, which is if, you know, just to say you just use the Q&A function. And, yeah, um, we've got one. We've got one? Yes. Marguerite wants to know more about the work in Gillingham. Ah. So, um, yes, let me try and find more of the images. So, um, let me show you the screen and I'll show you a bit more. Um, this is a model uh, in the Panacea Museum, which is about all these cults. This, mm -hmm. this row of shops was demolished only relatively recently in the past 10 years. In the foreground, this is a farm that Jezreel and his wife um, lived on. She had the nickname Queen Esther. She was despised by the cult. I'll tell you the, the, the story of the cult very quickly then. Um, Jezreel comes back from India. He starts to uh, attend a, a different cult who follows Southcott. And then he takes over the cult and he assumes the name James Jershom Jezreel, the triple J, which has biblical significance. Uh -huh. And he starts to run events where he reads um, from Southcott's writings and from other biblical texts and, um, and Jewish paraphernalia. And he kind of appropriates the appearance of a Hasidic Jew. A, a lot of the clothing and the, the dress codes and the hair cuts are appropriated from there. And that's to do with this idea of British Israelism. Um, and so the building itself is a kind of castle. He calls it a temple. Mm. Um, and inside, there's a cylindrical um, container. Uh, this, is the, this is inside the building when it was being built. You can see it's huge. And it would have housed 5,000 people. And there would have been a hydraulic floor that would have raised and lowered. And this was a preaching gallery and choir pit. Um, the model that um, we've been developing, and this, this is what it might have looked like inside. Um, so it was a steel frame building designed by an architectural firm in Rochester called Margate. And uh, it was fireproof, which if you're coming to the day, the end of days might be useful. <laughs> um, so it was yellow brick and it was a very, very adventurous piece of architecture architecture mm. he died in the lead up to the foundations being built then his wife took it over and she died later on she was a tyrant and one of the biggest benefactors uh, for the project who came over from Michigan a farmer called Noah Drew she evicted him and he lived in poverty on Gillingham High Street and there was a famous brawl in the street where the police had to be called and she had to acquiesce and give him some of his money back and house him better. So this is, you know, just before the turn of the century. And it's very, I, I was at the time of all this, I was watching Wild Wild Country and um, Bhagwan and this whole idea of the, you know, the Rajneesh uh, Purim and cults have always existed. The Mithras, so on, you know, Christianity cults are all around us we just have to scratch the surface for them what's interesting is how similar they all are in terms of their techniques for uh in terms of belief attractants and um keeping people interested by threatening the apocalypse essentially this is a so so there's a great book um it might be called virus of the mind uh, which is all about the the Th these techniques of meme deployment in a way and in italy we are in the country of the <laughs> virus of the mind <laughs> absolutely yeah catholicism yeah <laughs> oh, ah, i think we have another question oh yeah, color that... palette. good question yeah yeah i mean color is my operant and I'm, you know, the work is as much a research into 
how I can make new space using colour as it is about anything else. Um, what would be a good example? Um, where's the page? If, if we look at the Yakovitsi Paisley, uh, or the, these drawings, for example, I go between different suspensions of colour. That could be watercolour, gouache, acrylic, oil. It could be the colour of the computer. It could be the colour of dyes and printing. And each of these has a different space. What becomes interesting is when you counterpose them within or beside or amongst one another, and they start to generate new collaborations, new readings. And so to put the same blue in a dye space beside an RGB space on top of an acrylic space generates a third kind of uh, maximalist colour space. And the the kind of colour research that is going on in Yakovitsi Paisley, where I can go from these rich ochres to these very shrill fluoros, um, it's as much about trying to expand the colour universe as, as it is about the, that, that, that is one part of the meme, memeplex I'm trying to take further, I suppose. I hope that answers your question. But yeah, it is about um, making ugly things as a way of challenging my own preconceptions um, and yours. And yeah. Uh, John, sorry. All Go the sorry one question yeah, on. all the images uh, um taken uh, from Yakovitti mm. are taken from the um, uh the kamas the kamas ultra or yeah. another okay because yeah. for those who don't know uh in 1977 Yakovitti realized this uh, series of erotic uh, illustrations called uh, uh, Kamasultra yeah. um, and uh, he was uh, criticized a lot in Italy especially because in that moment uh, he was the, um, um, the illustrate, illustrator of uh, a Catholic uh, newspaper huh. uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it was a scandal basically <laughs> let me just try and answer some of these questions Margarita yeah. The building was at the top of Chatham Hill. There's a road called Jezreel's Road. And now there's a sort of adult education facility that has um, gone. And that is the plot where the building was. It's very clear if you go up there. Yes, the aim is uh, to show the work as part of the Estuary Festival, which was due to happen in September, but has been delayed till spring next year. So I will be in Medway and hopefully we can meet. Um, <laughs> Maria Pia, do you think that fake news media culture impacts on how memes are interpreted and how infectious they are? Um, what's interesting about memes is they don't care how they get re uh, replicated. Uh, and that's exactly why fake news works. It doesn't, uh, the memes have no moral compass. They will piggyback on whatever they need to be replicated. And fake news is a brilliant example of this kind of idea infection. Um, Diana's asking, could I talk about how I visualize the maker space within which memes operate on ours or the, the agency they replicate through? Um, they rep, the, the, the memes riff on our genetic drives and Susan Blackmore would argue that consciousness and so would Daniel Dennett is a result of the interaction between genes and memes in the brain. So in the performance that I did in New Zealand, there's a whole section of singing where I talk about how our ancestors came down from the trees and their brains were infected by symbiotic thinking tools. And I think increasingly that we are computers that have a memes of a software that we download onto our brains and we come without very much software. We come with the potential to install software, and Noam Chomsky will talk about language uh, acquisition, but you can have any language installed, that's mimetic. And you can also unlearn or relearn or learn new things. Um, but if you 
ally your memes with sexual things, food things, and so on, the drives, you know, fight, flee, fuck, feed, whatever, it's going to give them uh, a better chance. And somebody asked me what my favorite meme is. Well, it's obviously the Paisley pattern, which yeah. isn't a great example of. But um, yeah, I'm obsessed at the moment with this motif, which we'll call the bote, and how it has mutated as it has been spread. So I think we've answered most yeah. of the questions. Yeah. Um, so, oh, we've got Carl Foster. Does the space does the space of the face mask offer an interface between the real space of the virus and the space of your meme images, memes mm. and genes? God, that's a very thin space, isn't it? An in infraslim space. <laughs> um, the mask thing is interesting. It's who's using it here. The mask is a meme, definitely. It's caught <laughs> on, you know. It, people will feel more comfortable wearing it. The meme has tapped into the fear element, even if it's not doing you any help. Um, does it offer an interface between the real space of the virus? I think you sort of answered your own question, but I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at. But yes, masks are interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. This is definitely sure, sure. a blue rose moment. Yes. Well, I want to say thank you on behalf of BSR <laughs> to thank all you. our audiences who have engaged and given us the chance to um, to experiment with this medium. Um, but most of all, thank you to John and to Marta for just being such wonderful uh, conversationalists and bringing brilliant ideas to us so thank you very much um and somebody it's a very good place to end but we just had a question that say i just want to say how much i enjoyed this oh so, brilliant um and that stands for me and i hopefully the the 54 people up to 62 people that tuned in so thank you very much That's everyone coming. thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye.